Welcome to this last tutorial of this series of tutorial describing the results tables. The seismic information and story drift results tables will be described. The seismic information tables are accessed by go to table, seismic design, rigid or flexible diaphragm design, and seismic information. The information that can be found is the building mass, area, story shear force, and redundancy factor in each direction for each level and for the entire structure. The building mass generated for the analysis and the results can be edited by accessing the generate loads icon in the toolbar. The half right portion is dedicated to seismic loads where the user can decide to either generate or not seismic loads by checking or unchecking the seismic load options. It is possible to generate seismic load while not generating any building mass by activating the generate loads only not building masses option. As you can see, it is possible to generate building masses with custom user entries for floors, roof, ceiling, snow load, interior walls and exterior walls as cladding will most likely increase the self weight of the exterior wall compared to the interior walls. There is also the option of horizontal projection which can be activated for roofs, ceiling and roof snow loads. This will influence the way the mass is distributed when the roof is not flat. The asterisk beside the snow load is referring to the sentence 20% used and applies to the following criteria of ASC 7, which says that for any flat roof snow load exceeding 30 pounds per square foot, 20% of the uniform design snow load, regardless of the slope, will be taken as the design snow load. The distribution of the masses is done based on the assumption that the mass is acting at the floor diaphragm. Therefore, for a first and second level diaphragm of a three-story structure, 50% of the wall height of the wall below is taken and 50% of the wall height above is taken for the total wall height mass acting on the floor diaphragm under consideration. Consequently, the roof diaphragm total wall height is only half of the wall height below as there is no wall above. The latter is also true for a one-story structure where the total wall height considered for the mass is only half of the actual wall height. The area of the wall per level is considered in the vertical plane and ignores openings as windows and doors in general have a greater self-weight. For example, let's calculate the total building mass of this structure where the following self-weights were used for the load generation for floors, roof, snow load, and interior and exterior walls. The structure used for this tutorial is a two-story structure with an interior wall on the first floor along with a flat roof. This table shows the calculation in order to arrive to the same building mass as the program. First, it is important to note the self weights that were used, the floor area, wall perimeter, and the length of the interior wall. To start off, we will determine the mass of the second level attributed to the roof diaphragm. The roof self weight is multiplied to the roof area, then since the roof snow load exceeds 30 pounds per square foot, only 20% of it is taken according to the ASC 7 clause and then multiplied to the roof area. Next, since the last level wall height is 10 feet, half is 5 feet and it is multiplied to the perimeter and self weight of the exterior walls. All of this summed up together gives the building mass for level 2. Now for level 1, the floor self weight is multiplied by the floor area added to the self weight of the exterior walls multiplied to the summation of half the height of level 1 and level 2 and to the perimeter of the exterior walls. The last component that needs to be added to the first level building mass is the self weight of the interior wall multiplied half the height of the wall on level 1 and to the length of the wall. All of this together gives the building mass for level 1. Summing both of these mass for levels 1 and 2 gives the total building mass of the structure. Note that there are other ways to arrive to the building mass, but this is one of them. Now, 
Comparing the obtained building mass to the one calculated by the program, we can see that they are both the same. The redundancy factor rho, or sometimes called the reliability factor, need to be assigned to the seismic force resisting system in each of the two orthogonal directions for all structures in accordance with this section. This factor is to encourage the designer to have a reasonable amount and reasonable distribution of lateral force resisting system in his structure. The implication of this for wood structures is to have a reasonable amount of shear walls and of reasonable length fairly well distributed throughout the building. Two values are possible for rule, either 1 or 1.3. The following section of ASC 7 defines the conditions when rho is equal to 1 and when rho is to be taken as 1.3. The following ASC 7 section lists nine cases where rho shall be taken as 1, and among them, here are a few examples. All structures assigned to seismic design category B or C. For the calculation of the drift and P delta effect. And for the design of non-structural components. On the other hand, this ASC 7 section says that for all structures designated in the seismic design category D, E, or F, that row shall be taken as 1.3 unless the structure qualifies for a row of 1 by the use of one of two methods presented in the following section, where both of these methods require further evaluation of each story which shall resist more than 35% of the base shear. It is important to note that the program shear walls complies with all of the following clause. New in shear walls version 10 is the option to use the calculated redundancy factors, the value of 1 or 1 1.3. If the selected option is calculated, then for the initial design pass, rho is set to 1, and after the design, it is calculated, and if it is found to be 1.3, then the design is redone using a value of 1.3. This is done independently for both directions. As explained in tutorial 5.1, the seismic design category used to determine the redundancy factor is dependent on the risk category as well as the short period and one second period response acceleration parameters. The risk category is itself dependent on the use and occupancy of the building while the short period and one second period response acceleration parameters are dependent on the MAP maximum considered earthquake spectral response acceleration at short period and at a period of one second respectively. The maximum considered earthquake spectral response acceleration parameters at short periods is dependent on the foundation factor FA and the MAP spectral response acceleration parameter SS at short periods while the maximum considered earthquake at periods of one second is dependent on the foundation factor FV and the MAP spectral acceleration factor for period of one second S1. The foundation factors FA and FV are in turn affected by the site class as well as the MAP acceleration parameters SS and S1. Once the seismic design category is determined, the program will then implement the following clause of ASC 7. The seismic design category, defined in the following ASC section, is an indication of the relative seismic risk of a given structure. This risk is based on the consideration of both in terms of the design spectral response acceleration and the use of the structure in terms of occupancy category. The ASC 7 requires the use of more ductile frames as the seismic design category gets high which indicates a higher risk by imposing additional requirements to these seismic design categories. At the bottom of the legend, it is possible to notice a section allocated to the vertical earthquake load, also known as vertical seismic load. The seismic load effect, E, found in the following basic load combination for earthquakes, consists of two different components, horizontal and vertical components. The horizontal and vertical components are presented in the following section, which describes the seismic effect through the means of the two following equations. 
The horizontal seismic load effect is determined by the following equation of ASC7, where the redundancy factor presented previously is multiplied to the total design lateral force or shear at the base resulting from the application of horizontal forces simultaneously in two directions at right angles to each other. The vertical seismic load effect is determined by the following equation, where SDS is the design spectral response acceleration parameter at short periods obtained from the following section of ASC7, and D is the effect of dead load. In some cases, EV may be taken as zero, and those cases are described in the following section. The design spectral response acceleration parameter at short periods is obtained by the following equation, where SMS is the maximum considered earthquake spectral response acceleration parameter for short periods. The latter is defined by the following equation in the AASC 7 standard, where FA is the site coefficient factor and SS is the MAP maximum considered earthquake spectral response acceleration parameter determined from figures in the ASC 7. Note that there is also electronic values of MAP acceleration parameters and other seismic design values available at the USGS website referenced in ASC 7 standard.